Aloha, I'm your host Winston Welch and I am delighted you are joining us today for an extra special edition of Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and other topics of interest with people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. As a disclaimer, any views or opinions expressed by me are strictly my own and not connected with any organization. Joining me today in the studio, I am especially delighted to have the venerable Dr. Karma Lekshi Somo, Professor of Buddhism and World Religions at the University of San Diego, founder of Sakya Dita International Association of Buddhist Women, and the director of Jamyang Foundation, a charitable organization to provide education to girls and women in India and Bangladesh. I would like to read a little bit more because uh, as uh, Lekshi has a fascinating background, but she does specialize in Buddhist studies, offers classes in Buddhist thought and culture, world religions, comparative religious ethics, religious and political identities in global community, and negotiating religious diversity in India. Lekshi's research interests include women in Buddhism, death and dying, Buddhist feminist ethics, Buddhism and bioethics, religion and politics, Buddhist social ethics, and Buddhist transnationalism. Uh, also, Lexi uh, encourages students, uh, it would be wonderful to be a student in her class, to uh, question the assumptions that they bring to, about religion and life, and to dialogue on the fundamental questions of human experience, which I think is what we're all after. Uh, she does incorporate comparative and experiential approaches, including field research at local churches, temples, synagogues, and mosques. And her classes raise questions about the role of religion in contemporary life, including issues of race, privilege, gender, environment, economic ethics, politics, and violence. Uh, she encourages active discussion on issues of global concern, such as secularism, fundamentalism, religious syncretism, and interreligious dialogue. So that is a, a lot to say, but obviously you are a very fascinating person, and thank you so much for being on my show today. Thank you. It was uh, interesting how we just sort of uh, ran into each other. Um, as it turns out, you are friends with three people who I love and respect very much, Kathleen, Jackie, and Aisha. And we met at our neighbor Mary's and Linda and uh, uh, our friend uh, from Austria also um, said we should do a show together. So thank you for coming on the show today. Happy to be here. Uh, Susanne, yes, sorry, Susanne. I have a little bit of a cold, so I'm on some cold meds and just in case I'm not saying everything exactly perfectly. But um, so tell us, how does a young lady from California grow up to become a Buddhist nun? Well, um, it was an accident, perhaps, or maybe not, that my family name was Zen, Z-E-N-N. -N. So when I left um, California, Malibu, Malibu Surfing Association, and went to Japan to go surfing in 1964, um, I had no intention of going to a monastery, but then it started to snow. So I wound up meditating in a monastery outside of Tokyo and then got more and more into Buddhism as I went along. I started reading when I was very young, maybe about 11, and pronounced myself a Buddhist, which was quite unusual at that time, and then just kept running with it. So about how old were you when you went to Japan for that? Was that was, was 19. That 19. Mm -hmm. And so even just being a woman surfer in Japan or a surfer in Japan probably was unusual at that time. Yes, it was the very beginning. We had the first international, um, international surfing competition ever held in Japan. I was the only girl. <laughs> so it was quite a um, you know, breakthrough for Japan. And now, of course, it's really big. And you've continued to be a trendsetter, I see, all of your life um, with, with the path that you've taken, which is just so interesting for me. And, and sort of you just stumbled, stumbled into this, as, as it were. You could say that. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, to have a family name like that, that just led me directly to Buddhism. B people started teasing me about being a Zen Buddhist, and then I had to figure out what it was. So the kids at school would tease me, and then I went and found two books on Buddhism, read them from cover to cover, and said, that's it. Home free. So, um, and then just went over to Japan and to India and just kept um, trying to follow this path, find teachers. It wasn't as easy in those days as it is now. There weren't so many books. There weren't, I mean, temp so many temples. And so I had to do quite a bit of exploring. It was really interesting. Okay, so this has been a really fascinating life that you've had. 
just starting by going to Japan and, 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 and reading a couple books that just clicked with something inside of you that resonated and said, this is something I need to explore more. Right. And so you were able to follow that path. Your, uh, your parents were supportive? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, our generation were pretty rebellious. Mm -hmm. So um, I just sort of took a ship to Yokohama and, you know, sent them a postcard from there. And did, did you enter a, a monastery, or was it a training program? Or well, how did that, that was the problem. There weren't any monasteries for women that I could find. So there were a couple of temples where you could go and, and sit in meditation. But I was really looking for a monastery for women and couldn't find one. So that's why the path took a bit longer than I expected. Where did that path then lead you? Well, I went from Japan to Southeast Asia, and then up through India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and about a two-year journey, and still didn't find a monastery for women. Eventually, I had to, I had to start one. Oh. Yeah. In 1987, then we started a monastery up in Dharamsala, which is where the Dalai Lama lives. And um, that's grown into a huge monastery, 150 nuns. We've got 12 other ones as well. And are these monasteries, are they uh, they're for people from all backgrounds and all, all, all nations? Well, most of the nuns are from the Himalayan region, and they, because the medium of instruction is Tibetan. Okay. Yeah, so um, mostly they come from these different Himalayan areas. Anyone could come, but they would need to learn Tibetan. And, and I, I had read in your background that France was where you were originally, um, what's the correct word that I'm Ordained. Ordained. Ordained, okay. Right. And, and then... Was, there, was that in a, in a Western monastery? Or, um... well, it's a really interesting story. That, in fact, um, it was a monastery started by Bernard Benson, who used to live in Kailua, uh, one of the original founders of IBM. And he had gone to France and bought this uh, castle and turned it into a monastery. And I knew him as a child growing up in Malibu and wound up you know, meeting him again after many years in France when I got ordained there. And the Karmapa had been here in Hawaii, and in 1986, I was the cook. I was cooking for 13 lamas, or teachers, over in Kailua. So many connections, you know. And then I wound up being, taking my novice ordination with him in France, and later taking full ordination in Korea. And what's the difference between those two when you started in France and then continued in Korea? What, what steps were involved in that? Well, it's a bit complicated, but generally you would become a layperson first and take five precepts. Then you would become a novice and take ten precepts. And then eventually take full ordination with two or three hundred precepts. So it's a sort of a gradual process. And precepts would be... Things that you agree to do mm -hmm. or, or how mm -hmm. to act? or Yeah, not to lie, kill, steal, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And for the monastics, then, it's a celibate lifestyle. Yeah. So you got, uh, you got a couple hundred precepts that you will follow? Yes. Um, try. Try, right, because mm -hmm. we're all humans. Yes. And, um, last time I checked. Last time you checked. <laughs> okay, and then you started the, 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 the monastery for women. And is this monastery open to men as well, or is it just women at this time? Well, these still? monasteries are designed for women, because women have sort of been left out of the picture until now. When the Tibetans fled Tibet in 1959, thanks to His Holiness the Dalai Lama and his vision, they started setting up monasteries, recreating the monasteries they had in Tibet. But there weren't that many monasteries for women. So the monks could come and just sign up for a mon monastic education, but for women there wasn't much offered, so that's why we started some. And it still remains for, for women, for, for women yes. focus. We do have male volunteers though. In the summertime we, and wintertime also, we have male volunteers who come and teach, you know, English, um, Tibetan, Hindi, Buddhism, computer skills, all kinds of things. Okay, and so uh, I guess at this time then you're probably becoming very, um, you, you love what, the, what Buddhism is, what it stands for, how it has meaning in your life and, mm -hmm. and, and reflection for the, the greater world, but also at the same time you're feeling this lack of um, 
of empowerment of women inside of this, or how did that? Mm. How, how would you describe that? Well, um, I, I think that the goal of Buddhism, which is liberation, liberation from ego fixation and all misfortunes, is open to both men and women equally. But somehow over history, you know, somehow male, the male started to dominate, and women sort of took a back seat. And especially in the area of religion, religion and politics, the areas where the most power is at stake, somehow tend to be, even in this country, dominated by men. So now is the new time, and things are actually readjusting. And women are taking more visible roles in all of these fields. It's really exciting. Do you think that, uh, that the last time that we really had sort of women-centered religions was maybe with the earth goddess sort of religion? Or, um, or when, when was the last period where we had that sort of uh, equality or, or generation of women? Well, we don't really know because we don't have historical records of those cultures. I think that women have power in all religious traditions, but it's not always visible. It's not always public. Uh, sometimes it's private, and maybe that's an asset. But in terms of um, you know, social change and so forth, it's also important that women take visible public roles. And, and we to, are, I'm sorry. Right, and to do that, we need education. And we need education, <laughs> and uh, that, that folds into what you're doing with your Jam Yang Foundation, right. as well as with Sakya Dita, and we'll, we'll talk more about that after the break. But I think as we look across most of the large world religions, we're, we're seeing um, a, a lack of, of women in, in major leadership roles or even, even an access to inequality of, of, of position or stature or um, ability to access uh, these sacred areas. But it's changing rapidly. It's, it's definitely changing and very rapidly. I just was up at the Parliament of World Religions in Toronto in yes. November. And it was remarkable to see the presence of women, many of whom are now in positions of, of power or authority or change mm -hmm. in the world's major religions. Uh, it's very exciting. And um, they're working together. We're dialoguing, uh, dialoguing with each other, dialoguing with men. And um, I think it's a new age. It's a, a time of real opening, opening of the heart. And it's infectious. It's um, starting to change every aspect of life, economics, politics, religion, education. Uh, women are just taking much more visible roles and feeling more confident to do that and getting more education to do that. And uh, your work obviously is contributing to a lot of this and empowering uh, young ladies across the globe and following your example, but especially um, at your at the uh, Jam Yang Foundation, which I would like to talk about when we get back from our break. Um, some more, as well as some other uh, important questions I would like to ask you, and we won't be able to cover everything today. But uh, again, we are delighted to uh, be talking with the Venerable Dr. Karma Lekshi Tsomo, a professor at the University of San Diego, and uh, a feminist and Buddhist scholar. And we are delighted that she is here with us on Out and About on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We'll be back in just a moment. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at two o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're gonna be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, Let's take healthy back. Aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. We're back, we're live, and I'm Winston Welch, and this is Out and About on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series, and we are delighted to have an extra special episode of Out and About 
talking with Venerable Dr. Karma Lekshi Somo, Professor of Buddhism and World Religions at the University of San Diego, a founder of Sakya Dita, International Association of Buddhist Women, and director of Jam Yang Foundation, a charitable organization to provide education to girls and women in India and Bangladesh. Again, thank you so much for uh, being on the show today. And it was just serendipity uh, that we could come together due to our friends and just the forces conspiring to bring us together. I think as you were mentioning before with uh, the founder of IBM, and, uh, one of the founders, and yes. it just sort of happens that way. You're, yeah. you're just destined to meet whoever you're supposed to meet. The and Buddhists call it karmic connections. Karmic connections, okay. <laughs> and uh, so after you, after you became ordained, then you decided to go back to school and get a PhD? Well, I went back to India and studied for many years in the Himalayas, in Dharamsala, where the Dalai Lama lives. And then in 1989, I got bitten by a snake. Oh. Oops. Yeah, it was almost fatal. Oh. And because of that, then I came back. So uh, while I was recovering from that episode, near, near fatal episode, then I went back to school. When in doubt, go back to school, right? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, wound up with a PhD in comparative philosophy from here at UH Manoa. So that's how I accidentally became a professor. That must have been a really fascinating course of study. Uh, it was. In, in what you were doing. And, 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 and you were doing this, of course, still while you've, you've been in on all of this time. Yes. And so that mm -hmm. hasn't changed. Now, would you consider yourself a feminist? Yes, I would. Um, from, you know, the definition of someone that defined feminism as the radical theory that women are completely human. And I think... From that perspective, no doubt at all, uh, women are completely human. Yes. And um, we, can, we have the potential to do great things, so including enlightenment. So. Yeah. And I would say, if you're not a feminist, men included, why, why would you not be a feminist? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. We're, we, we're in a great awakening now where we are leveling up in, in all of the things that, that um, you know, you were talking on one of your uh, YouTube um, interviews about how we all have to be aware of our own biases and our unconscious mm -hmm. biases, which is even harder, right. but our biases that because as, because we're humans, we are all racist. We're all sexist. We're all homo or heterophobic, um, transphobic. Um, you know, we're ageist, we're classist. That's just what humans do. So it's about us being aware of it, doing what we can to overcome it so that we can, we can create a, a level playing ground where humans can thrive. Well, you could say that we're all conditioned by our circumstances. And some of these misunderstandings get inculcated in us from a very young age. But it's not permanent mm -hmm. because the mind is flexible and we have the power of critical inquiry. So when we think about it, a lot of these attitudes that we may have learned uh, don't hold water. And so we can change our minds. That's the whole uh, idea of awakening awakening to what really is in front of us, right? A human being that the base, the mind at root is clear, knowing, awareness. And then all of the thoughts and ideas that we learn from our environment, from our education, are mutable. And so we have a chance to shape those and, yes. and, and change them if we, yes. if we become aware of things that are not serving us any right. longer. And we can also become aware of that societally. And I think we're seeing that shifting in all, in all areas, economically and politically and religiously. And just you think about how women have completely come into it. I mean, just look at the, the and we thought we were there. And then you have the whole Me Too thing that came out, which really just sort of exploded everything across the board. And it wasn't just for the, the, the obvious issue of what Me Too was about, but it was more this, this larger thing. Like, we really haven't finished this discussion here yet. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Now, we've still got a lot of work to do. We've made a lot of progress, but as we could see in the previous year, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of transforming attitudes. And part of it is women transforming our own attitudes toward ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we hold ourselves back. So awakening to our own potential is also very important, and the potential of others around us, encouraging one another, men and women. Do you think that this, uh, that this ability to awaken to our potential is equally accessible in all of the, all of the, the main world religions that we have out there and, yes. and, and uh, um, not so main world religions that we have out there? I think the potential is definitely there in all of the world religions. It's a matter of how it's used. 
and how it's um, nurtured. Uh, if it's nurtured well, then it can be totally transformative. And I think that society is due for transformation. So if the religions of the world have tools to offer, let's make the most of them. Let's optimize. And Buddhism has become increasingly familiar for Americans, even though we may not quite understand. Uh, we can get the precepts or, or these basic ideas, you know, don't lie and, and, and cheat and steal and, and kill and those sorts of things. But why do you think Buddhism, Buddhism is becoming more popular in America? And where do you see it going from here? Well, a lot of people say it's because life has become so very stressful and that people need tools to learn how to calm down, how to understand the mind. Where does anger come from? Where does greed come from? A lot of the driving factors that are causing problems around the world, um, you know, economic and political problems, can be traced to our own mental cultivation. If we can become more peaceful people on an individual level, then that can also influence our families and our communities. And, our nation, and therefore our world. So this is the idea. We start here, and um, then we go from there. And once we clear up a lot of the greed, hatred, and ignorance in our own hearts, then we're more effective agents of social change. I, I, I have a sticky on my computer that says the only precious being I can save is myself mm -hmm. uh, on some level, because we all have to do the work ourselves. Well, initially, yes. But ultimately, I think that the broader vision is to transform the whole society. Mm -hmm. And that would be, I mean, include men, women, and, and for the Buddhists, also the animals. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. it's a, it, it, it a big part of my life. I, I often say if I have a question, I just look deeply into the, the dog's eyes and ask her what, whatever the question is, and she will relay the answer just telepathically. And I think that there's a lot of truth in that. <laughs> Uh, so you are planning to start a, a center up on the North Shore in Waialua, mm -hmm. and when is that going to take place? Or? Well, it's starting now. We've got the land, we've got a small building, a small shed, and we've started planting trees. We want to do agriculture, organic farming, and also to create a, a center for peace where people can learn peace, acquire the tools of becoming more peaceful people. And um, sort of like a light center, in a way, you could say. Mm -hmm. Open to everyone, different religions, different backgrounds, uh, where we can all learn together. And where, yeah. uh, what's, is there a website where people can go for information about mm -hmm. that? It's on the Sakadita website under local projects, Sakadita Hawaii. Sakadita mm -hmm. Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to uh, Sakadita. So um, we have a couple of web images of this, and so if you can tell us what mm -hmm. is uh, what is Sakyadita and how did okay. you start it, and and what's going on with it now? Good. Well, we um, started it in 1987 with a small conference in Bodh Gaya where the Buddha achieved enlightenment, and the His Holiness the Dalai Lama opened it and encouraged us all to study and and uh, you know do our best as women in Buddhism. And we had, uh, discovered we had noticed the inequalities in Buddhism until that time. The tradition was very male-dominated, but we weren't all really aware of it. And this was sort of the beginning of an international movement. And over the last 30 years, every two years, we meet together um, to talk about um, how we can do the best to transform women's lives around the world, women and children. So this year, it's going to be in Australia. For the first time, it'll be outside of Asia. 99% of Buddhist women live in Asia. So until now, we've held it in countries in Asia. And the largest one was 2,400 women wow. and men who came to uh, Ho Chi Minh City wow. in Vietnam. And then we've had smaller conferences of maybe 600, but with workshops and meditations and cultural performances and so forth, it's a way of b bringing women together and creating an alliance of women who can work together to help change the world. And the one that you've got coming up is already sold out, even though it's a month away. Right. And uh, I don't know how many people are going to be coming to that one, but obviously more than you have capacity, uh, uh, more want to come than you have capacity for. And That's true. It's become really, really popular. Maybe this is going to be coming every year. Well, it could be. Yeah. Let's see. Maybe so. Seems like there's a demand <laughs> for it. And, right. uh, and you were one of the co-founders of, of yes. that. And, mm -hmm. and the Dalai Lama has been very supportive of your efforts? Yes, he has. Okay. Right. So, so right. that's uh, and, and wonderful to hear and that we all have our, our allies. We, and, and, yes. And they just, they just show up because uh, they're there and people do want to help. They want to they support us for all of our, our, our potential is to grow as humans. Tell us yeah. about your, your really wonderful Jam Yang Foundation. 
Well, this is a project to bring education to women in the Himalayan region and among the hill tribes of Bangladesh. Um, also, we have outreach programs in Nepal and Mongolia and many different countries. And it's a way of encouraging women to um, get educated, to study and do the best they can, become teachers, become role models, mentors for others. And it's been tremendously successful in the last 30 years. Mm, in December of 17, we found um, 20 Buddhist women from the Himalayan region had become uh, geshes, which is the highest degree in philosophy. And women had never had done this before in Buddhist history. And so it was a real breakthrough for women. And now they can become teachers, I mean, achieving sort of like a PhD in Buddhist studies. And so we're very pleased and happy about this. And it shows that women really do have tremendous potential. Uh, right. And that's a, that's a, it's, it's, it's a 501c, is it, is it headquartered yes. in America? Yes, both of these are 501c3 charitable organizations registered in the United States. Okay, so people yeah. can, uh, can Google, if you just Google Karma Lekshi, you can find out uh, some links there to Sakya Dita or Jam mm -hmm. Yang Foundation, uh, but it's probably jamyangfoundation.org, I'm Yes, guessing. that's right. Mm -hmm. And there's a donate button on A donate button on there, so <laughs> yep. if, uh, if you are, are moved to help uh, young, young girls uh, achieving their potential, then I, I can think of no better uh, uh, foundation to give to because these young ladies are the future of our world and being led by amazing teachers like you and examples like you. And I just, unfortunately, we are out of time. As I said, this will go very fast. And it has been a real honor and a pleasure to have you as my guest today. And I really appreciate it. And I will hope that you will come back in the future when you're in Hawaii, because you do come back to oh, Yes, I come back all the time. You come back all the time. Yeah. And I want to give a special shout out to uh, my own mother, who is a very kind and lovely person and watches my show and says, my guests are amazing, which they are just like the one I had today. So thanks for watching my show, Mom, and all the other moms out there. And it was a happy Mother's Day yesterday. Hi. Um, we have amazing people here also at uh, Think Tech Hawaii. We have Eric Alander, who's our floor manager, and Robert McLean, who is our broadcast engineer, and Jay Fidel, our executive producer, who puts it all together. Uh, I'm here every other Monday at 3. If you love these guests at, at uh, Think Tech Hawaii, please go online also and donate to Think Tech Hawaii, because that's how we stay afloat. So uh, share the love, folks, and um, my great appreciation again to Venerable Dr. Karma Lekshi Somo our guest today from the University of San Diego and uh, a, a director of the Jam Yang Foundation and founder of Sakya Dita um, as well. But thank you so much for joining in and that's all we have time for. Hello everyone.